who is a sincere seeker of the truth, grab your scriptures, a vigil, and a piece of paper. You are about to hear the most profound, dynamic, soul story information ever produced the shores of America. You are about to hear a true teacher, not a preacher. So come, let us step from the darkness into the true light with Al Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Master. نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الوالي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحدي والمجدد لمن مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no partner? And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the God, and on the Mujaddah, the Reformer, which was all set from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, the true light featuring as Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. If I have a, a Sunni prayer time book, it's no good. Well, the prayer book is good for the recitation and all that, but the schedule that they come in from the Islamic Center out of Washington, D.C., yes, yes, the yes, timing yes. is really off. off. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that they misguided you and me and many others by our trust in them. Yes, it's not so much of what we do when we're wrong, it's what we do when we know what is wrong. That's why the word kafiruna in the Quran does not mean disbeliever. It comes from the root word kathara, to conceal what one knows or to hide something. Once we know right from wrong and still do wrong, then we bring the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. But when we don't know, Allah is our God. He protects us. Okay. And let me clear the other thing that you all discussed about the light. What has happened is the so-called Arab world, pale Arabs, has instituted through computers a worldwide method for when Muslims should make salah. You follow? They have ignored the reality of the time of salah based on the sky, and they just come up with calendars that they constantly keep putting in the computer year after year and submitting it around the world, even though after reading collections of hadith, as well as when the children of Israel prayed, which is the custom that Ibrahim followed, they're not following what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad really said. It is now become an institutional time of salah. And even in our book Ramadan, we would use that institutional time of salah not to cause conflict with the Muslim world, with everybody versing each other. You understand? Yes, but in reality, when a Muslim prays, it's when the light is in the sky but before the sun has risen. That means it's like blue in the sky. The time that Muslims are praying now, like four o'clock, and 3 o'clock when it's pitch black is not the time for Fajr. Why? Because in the Holy Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Salat of Fajr, the word itself, Fajr, means what? Dawn. That's right. And what does the word dawn imply to us when we hear it? Darkness or when the sun is coming up? Yes. Did you know what I'm saying? Yes. So if we look towards Kalam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran as our means of reference, just by looking at the meaning of the word Fajr, we'll know when to pray. But if we look to the collections of Hadith by these Pakistanis and these Egyptians and these Saudis who are trying to institutionalize Islam so it falls into the modern framework of religion, they have us all praying at the wrong time. And we have discussed that this year in our community that we are going to institute amongst the Ansari, regardless of what the Egyptians or the Saudians or the Sudanese even say we're going to establish the Salah according to the Quran and based on the time by the meaning of the word 
The word Bum has a meaning. The word Asa has a meaning. The word Mazarit has a meaning. The word Isha has a meaning. And the word Fajr has a meaning. And basing it on those meanings, we will get to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to do, not the traditions of men, which so many Muslims have seemed to fall into. We all have fallen into the trap of following the traditions of men, and we've laid aside the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has reached that point where I'm sorry, we don't care what the outer world says, we're going to do what the scripture says, whether they like it or not. And those Sunnis who are intelligent enough will check our book for the reasons. Forget whether or not they accept our doctrine or what we say we are, who we feel we are, but they investigate the reasons and the uh, etymology of the word, the definitions, and what it describes to based on its meaning in the Quran, they'll be intelligent enough to follow. If not, they'll verse us and follow them so called Sunna scholars who are people who are leading people away from the Quran intentionally with these hadith. Okay? They are Jews in disguise and they were trying to hide the power of the Quran by burying Muslims in the hadith. So we wouldn't go back to the words of Allah. We'd be dependent on Bukhari, Shafi, Maliki, Hamla, Tilmi, Muslim, and people like that, and not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Um, I was hoping you'd be able to explain to me chapter, I mean, John chapter 3, um, verse 11 to 16. The reason I'm covering that much is, actually, I would want number 14, but I think if I went from 11 to 16, it would clear up more, because I think it's kind of short by just going by number 14. Uh, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witnesses. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what I want to question is that number 14, that line there, just said, as Moses lifted up his servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I understand. Turn that. to John chapter 8, verse 28, and it answers it literally. John 8, 28? Yes. Okay. Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he really say? Yeah, okay. I that you say the power that Moses had came from the Heavenly Father when he changed the staff or the Asa into a serpent, and the power that you see me with also did not come from me, they came from the Father. Please read it again for the people who might miss that that what he's really trying to tell people is all that I do, I have no power. I, of my own accord, he's saying, I can do nothing without the Father. Read it one more time. Okay. Then says these unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. So when you realize that I am the Son of a mortal, they use the word there, Son of Man, when this can be misinterpreted as the English language, like man is identified with the male gender, as opposed to humanity. Jesus was referring to himself as the son of a human being. And the human being he was talking about was his mother Miriam or Mary, alayhi salam. Right? This is who they were talking about. So he said, once you have exalted me and treated me in my full glory, then you will know that I am the son of man. He was the son of Mary as well as the son of Allah so far. He was an angel incarnate. All right? Yeah. And what did he say right after that? That I do nothing. nothing of myself. Now I ask the Christian over and over again, if the Messiah Jesus said out of his own mouth right here, I do nothing of myself, why are they sitting around waiting for him to do something for them? When they should turn to the heavenly father who sent him, who he said he was not greater than. When they asked Jesus, what is the highest of all the commandments, what did the Messiah say? Lord, that God is one God. And he should have no other. Oh, God. And so he is not it. He has no power to do nothing for you that does not come by way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his father and yours who sent him. He said, again, I do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, that means Jesus, the Messiah, had to learn what he did. 
and what he said. Because he said, as my father hath in past tense taught in past tense me, I speak these things. Everything I say, I have learned from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I did not come up with them myself. And now when he says, I do nothing of myself, he's separating himself as an individual. He became a first person singular. Yet in the Bible, the Almighty keeps saying, we created, we did. He includes the heavenly host or the Elohim when he speaks. Jesus speaks in a first person singular as an individual. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father. Not me and the Father are one, not I am God and God is in me, but my Father, separating himself from the Father. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me, he did not come on his own. Like the Christians say, Jesus came down from heaven into a body. Jesus never said he came down from heaven into a body. He said he was sent down from heaven into a body. And who sent him down from heaven? He says it right there. And he, meaning the heavenly father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he that sent me is what? With me. Because Jesus said the same light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world in the book of St. John. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And that comes all the way back to Genesis when the heavenly father, the Elohim, said, I blew my spirit into man and man became a living soul. When the Holy Quran chapter 15 says, and I placed my spirit inside man and man became a living soul. This is what he's saying. The father is in me. When you see me, you see the father because in me is eternal life and the father never dies. So when you see me, you see eternal life. Then what is he going to say? And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not what? Left me alone. Has never left me as one, as one alone. You see that? He has not departed from me. So don't tell me that when he was on the cross, the Father departed away from him. No way. For I do what? I do always those things that please him. I always do what pleases my father. That's all. I always do what pleases my father. And then he goes down after being questioned. And he spoke these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to the Judites, which believed on him, those that did, what? If ye continue in my words, then ye are my disciples indeed. And? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's that verse that everybody likes to use, so, you know, they use it, use it, use it like it belongs to them. He's talking to the Judites when he says that. He says, any of you Jews that do believe on me, you will be freed. Any of the Judites, the tribe of Judah, that believes on me, and the words that I'm teaching you, which he just told you in 29, came from his father, not himself, you will be free. Because they thought that the Messiah had come down from heaven to fight against Rome and to liberate Israel and free them from the bondage of Rome. So he said, well, if you accept my word which I brought to you from the Father who sent me, you will be free. You see? You may not be free in body, but you will be free in what? Spirit, because you will have received the Holy Spirit. Okay. And also one more question. Why do some brothers get the prostration mark? It shows up a little clearer on some brothers than it does others. Because some people, because they read that you get a prostration mark by prostrating, get on the floor and rub their head. If you make salat properly in the Western world, you won't get it. You'll find, if you see pictures of me with it, it's right after I came from the East, where they pray on marble or they pray on hot sand and you burn your forehead. If you pray here in America in your house with a rug, and you lay down your face, and according to the practices of the Sunnah of Rasulullah, you put chin, then forehead, you'll never get a burn mark. The brothers you see with the burn marks, the Sunnis, they're doing that. They're rubbing their head on the ground, so it look like they got the mark. You get that mark in the east, because places like Mecca, because they made marble floors in a place where the climate runs between 115 to 120 degrees. So when you're walking around in Mecca, most of the people are running because they're trying to get their feet off the ground. It is hot over there. Right. Then when someone tells you to put your face on that and prostrate, you got to have a whole lot of faith to intentionally put your face down in a frying pan. 
This is a part of the pilgrimage that people don't know. You go to a place like Sudan where it's 130, 112, 115 degrees and make prostration and hold your face down is difficult. And then the funniest thing that happens is sometimes you get that fanatical imam who's a fanatical and instead of him just going, Subhana Rabbil Ala, Subhana Rabbil Ala, he goes, Subhana Rabbil Ala. And you're saying, please hurry up. He has a callus on his forehead because he's been doing it for years. He, I'm serious, because he's been burning it on his head for years. You just come home to visit, right. and now you got to put this first layer of skin on this hot marble. These are realities that people don't want to deal with. Right. I have a habit of calling things the way they are. A lot of people don't like that, but I say if you go to Mecca, it's not fun. If you lose that spiritual part. You know, when you're on your way in, everybody's like, Baik Allah, Humma Baik, all that's beautiful. When you get in the airport and they start fumbling through your luggage and pushing people and asking you how long you plan to stay, how much money you got, what hotel, you know, it loses that. But Muslims only see it, I'm going to hide. So you're going to Saudi Arabia, a government, where they're going to treat you like you're a foreigner who are coming on a tour. And then when you get in the hotel, they're going to be fumbling through your stuff. When you go down the street, there's a million people on the street in one city. That's real when you get over there. Don't nobody fool you. It's miserable. Yeah. I always tell brothers from our mouth, if you're going to Mecca, go out of season first. Go to Umrah when everybody's not there, and then you'll see Mecca, you'll see the Kaaba, you'll see these things, and then go back for Hajj because you got the spirit in you. Right. The father, and you know what you're up against. I got a four-part question to ask. First part is uh, how does one receive the Holy Spirit? The first thing a person must do to receive the Holy Spirit is become born again. That means they gotta rid themselves of all the things that they think is right. See, that's the biggest problem we have as humans. We got a whole lot of the way I see this, the way I think this is, the way it should be, instead of just the way it is in accordance with the words of Allah, Kalam Allah, in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit will descend upon you when the temple is clean. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the second part of it is how does one feel physically and uh, how does it affect your senses? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you? Yes. You may have had him visit you while teaching. You ever been teaching somebody and try to find a quote in the Bible and the Bible opens up to the quote for you? Mm -hmm. That was the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. Just open your mouth and I'll put my words into you. They'll pass through you. It doesn't always stay there. Because in St. John's it says, He who you see the Spirit descend upon and stay there forever, that is the Messiah. You see, that's not you. <laughs> so the Spirit will come down and pass through you. That feeling you get inside, sometimes when you're reading something and the truth just unfolds right in front of you. And that's a strange feeling of a sensation, a joy that settles in your heart. You ever had that feeling? Mm -hmm. That's the Holy Spirit moving in you. <laughs> and that can make you get up and shout. But it won't throw you on no ground. You feel good, but not good enough to bang your head on no concrete. You follow? Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you maintain it? By disciplining yourself to make the temple comfortable enough to dwell in. The spirit will stay as long as the temple is comfortable. You know what that means? All the things that you say you are, you are. All the things you say you believe, you do. All the things that you know you should not do, you don't do. But the moment you dirty the temple, then Jesus will come with a stick and beat the filth out of the temple. That's what that symbol of him is, turning the tables off and beating people out of the temple. Because they were doing things in the temple that was wrong. And he turned to the disciples and said, you see that symbol? They didn't understand what he was talking about. You are the temple, he said, because he said, destroy the temple and I'll raise it in three days. And he explained later that he was talking about his body. Your body is the temple. And if you don't purify the temple, you still got the bad habits and the bad thoughts and the bad dreams and the bad aspirations. Then the spirit can't reside in you. You have to make the temple clean for the spirit. That's why he told those people who wanted to stone that woman for holotry. He said, let him without sin cast the first stone. Within a couple of minutes, only him and that woman would stand there. Everybody else had walked away. Because how many people in that room can say, I am totally sinless? How many of y'all in that room can say that? I am totally sinless. Everything I know is right, I do. Everything I know is wrong, I shun. Who can raise their hand in that room and say, I am totally sinless? Because if you do, that would be your first sin. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, can you uh, have, uh, you said cleanse yourself, uh, can you uh, cleanse your spirit and your mind, and but your body will be unhealthy? Can you receive the Holy Spirit even? No. It's a total commitment. It's all of you. You just, the person can't say, in my heart I'm good. See, if that's the case, then the Almighty would have never put the truth in books. He would have just put it in everybody's heart. 
People are underestimating the power of the Father when they say stuff like, as long as I got Islam in my heart, that's all it counts. Because in that case, if Allah thought your heart was so powerful, he would have put it inside there. Why did he put the Quran in a book and make you digest it when he had the power to just put the whole book inside you? Because there is a part of it that's physical. There is a part of it that's disciplined. Because the temptations of the devil can't work on the soul. They can only work on the body. And the body interprets it for the soul. They have to put physical naked women on television to plant the thought in the mind for the soul to interpret it as lust. You understand? The devil works from the physical back to the soul. He cannot touch your soul. Your soul will burn the devil. You understand? So everything he does to you, he does by seduction. He does it by manifesting things in the physical world. He gives you interests in the physical world. And things in the physical world will pull down your soul. And eventually you give your soul to him. When you start living for of and by him. You and all of us have been guilty at one time or the other being around white people and trying to talk like them. You feel talking like white people makes you more accepted. And straightening your hair makes you more accepted. And dressing like white people and shaving your beard makes you more accepted. Makes you accepted by who and what? You know what you're saying? You're saying, devil, accept me. I'm not talking to the white man as a devil. I'm talking about the image that the white man projects in the devil because everything he projects is love. The baby suits are getting skimpier, the pants are getting tighter, the fake hair is getting longer. It was bad enough when black people had jelly curls. Now they got some dead person's hair in their hair. Or some animal, or some plastic braids into their hair, and they think they look like Marilyn Monroe. You've got to get away from that Alice in Wonderland, dear, because you are not Alice, and this is not your land. You follow that? You all got to get away from it, because it don't apply to you. All the commercials on television is for his people. They ain't making no ladies. You know what Lady Clara does to black people's hair? That's for them, because if they don't do that, they look like a dead dog. And they don't groove their hair, they don't put blush on and eyeliner, they look like an uncooked sausage. Black women, you don't need all the artwork. The Almighty gave you the artwork. That's why everybody in the world goes to beaches. They go to beaches to become black. They just say tan. Then when I say I'm black, they say, you're not black, you're brown. You're not really black, you're a Negro, you're brown. Okay, suppose I start saying I'm tan. Then what they have to do? Change all the tan stuff to something else? Yeah, they'll call it copper tone. And then if I start saying I'm copper toe, they have to change it to Negro. Let's go to the beach and get Negro. They're going to the beach to get black. They're curling their hair to get nap. Now, they're even getting injections in their lips to get some lips. Mm -hmm. This is on television now. Michael Jackson and good brothers like that have been confused or cutting their nose away, and white people are picking the flesh up and putting it on there. You have been blessed. You have been blessed with what everybody wants. That may sound crazy, but ain't nobody got no soul like you. Nobody can survive the stuff you survive. And be still popping your finger. I mean, brothers be popping their finger, they ain't even got no food in the fridge there. But still find room to crack a joke and laugh. And everybody says about us, boy, it's some colorful people. You understand? You know what that is? That's soul. Because they can take everything from us but our soul. We'll be laughing and hungry. And be laughing about the fact that we eating plain sugar on bread. We be laughing. The white people would jump out the window as soon as the stock market clashes. They go right to the window. They don't pass go. They don't collect that you under the open and wham. They can't survive without money. Because Revelation 13 tells you that is the devil's symbol. That people will buy nor sell except for those who have the mark of the beast. If you don't have the mark of the beast in the palm of your hand or on your head, you can't buy or sell. They're talking about money. And you don't believe me, go down the wall and see one day and just look up and just watch the board and watch those people there. Screaming and yelling, how about this, how about this? You know what I'm saying? And the man goes, close, and he goes, oh. They're like robots. Have anybody ever seen that? Mm -hmm. It's amazing to watch that. They're like robots begging and begging and begging. And then the man says, okay, close. They go, oh. They stand there for 10 minutes. Another board comes up, they run over the other board. It is sad that people have left faith in the Almighty behind and they live by the rules of men. They put down the Ten Commandments, and now they're talking about some constitution written by men. They don't apply to you. Y'all better have wake up. We got a little bit of time to so get a lot done. Okay, and uh, I don't know if this might seem like a silly question, but when you receive the Holy Spirit, where does it put you in respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It makes you a son of Allah. You change from a son of man.
to a son of Allah. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. He kept saying, I'm a son of a human being. He used the word Bashra in certain places and Insan in other places. The word Bashra, when it says that, means mortal. The word Insan means human being. So he kept saying, I am Ebed Bashra, I am Ebed Insan. And he was referring, to people say man, and the psychology there is that when you say man, you keep thinking it's talking about a man, and it's not. It's talking about a woman. And the woman he's talking about is his mother Mary. When he said, I'm the son of man, you see, man is not a gender. Man can be male or female. When Jesus was saying that, he was trying to tell them that I have a physical mother and a spiritual father. He would say, I'm the son of man and I'm the son of God. And they wouldn't understand what he's talking about. The son of man meant that he was the son of a human being, Mary. And the son of God meant that he was the son of an angelic being, as the brother said, the Holy Spirit, Gabriel. The combination made this unique creature the only begotten of the Father in his time, full of grace. Jesus the Messiah. So yes, once you purify yourself and the Spirit starts to control you, it starts to re-educate your soul, then you are a son of God. And that's what Jesus said. As many as believe on me, to them I give the power to become the sons of God. Okay? Three things taking place here on earth for the change. One, the Father came. Second, the Son came. And third, the Holy Spirit came. After this, then it will be a new heaven and a new earth. Could you explain now if I'm correct? If you look at it from that order, you must start from the book of Genesis. All right? Yes. And in Genesis, when he speaks about the creation of man, he says he blew into man of his spirit, and man became a living soul. Yes. Correct? Yes. That is the Elohim talking, because he's speaking from a plural. He says Elohim. He put his spirit into man, and man became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Then that's the Father. By the time we get to Jesus, now we're down to the Son, as you say, mm -hmm. it's St. John. And he says, in him was the light, and the light was the light of man. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Right. All right? They say that the same light, number seven, the same came for witness, to bear witness of that light, that through him all might believe. Right? He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. Right. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is the light of the Father, the light of the Son, and the light of the Holy Spirit are all one light. The same light which lighted every man, and not three separate lights. The same light. The light is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who in the Quran is referred to as Nur or Samawati wa Arda, the light of the heaven and the earth. You see? So you're right in what you're saying. It's just we gotta be careful that we don't violate the highest of all the commandments, is what Jesus said, and that is that the Lord thy God is one God. We don't make that mistake, and then people say Trinity and don't understand what they mean. Yes. So the light of the Father, who he breathed in man in the very beginning, the light of the Son, which Jesus is speaking about in St. John, and the light of the Holy Spirit, which will come in Muhammad again as a comforter, is still one light, Allah. Allah. We now have for your listening pleasure a complete set of the True Light tapes. There are now more than 24 hours of answers to the questions that have boggled the minds of humanity. For more than 20 years, the eminent master, Imam Isa, has answered all questions put before him, from skeptics to true believers. Jews, Christians, Muslims, all have increased their understanding of the words of the Most High by listening to the True Light on WWRL. Where can I get the True Light tapes? You can get the true light from your local answer our representative that you see dressed in white. Or come down to the original tents of Kedar, 719 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. I still go to church. 
and I've asked my minister many questions from the two light chairs that he cannot answer. I've listened to Jimmy Swaggart and other ministers, but I find that Imam Isa is the only one who can explain the book of Revelations. I've been a Jehovah's Witness since I was a child, and I thought I had a monopoly on the truth. But I listened to the true light tapes on the radio and have come to understand the truth about the life of Jesus. I listen to your broadcast every week, and as a result of the true light tapes, I am now a follower of Imam Isa. Yes, the true light tapes do make a difference. The true light can change your life. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And now, let us return to our broadcast. Here, I, it, is, it is a symbolic term anyway, the word word. light, because yeah, light. Uh, it is, it is, it is, it, light here means teaching no. in the present. No, no. Light here means life. He says it right in the scriptures. He says, the light is the life in man. It's not teaching. And that's because in Genesis he said, I blew into man of the breath of life, and man became a living soul, and soul is symbolic as illuminating, as having an aura, you see? So there is wisdom and knowledge and understanding in possessing the light of the Heavenly Father, but light is really symbolic of the breath of life according to the scriptures. The light of the lighting man, it says. Okay, this Zion that uh, is on the mound, and with him is a hundred and forty and four thousand. This revelation here, is it that it is already, because all of it is fulfilled already. Okay, let's say I'm from the tribe of Levi, which definitely I am. And you all turn to the book of Psalms, verse 48, 11. It will tell you that Zion is Judah. Zion is not all the tribes. Zion is the tribe of Judah only. The book of Psalms 48 will tell you that. 48.11 48, 11 reads, Let Mount Zion rejoice, let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgment. Walk about Zion and go around and go round about her, tell the powers thereof. If you go to 2 Samuel, the 5th chapter, the 7th verse, it will tell you that Zion is in a place called Jerusalem, the city of David. 2 Samuel 5, verse 7. Seven. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Now, when you use the word Zion, the first thing is to realize that the word within itself means hilltop. It's an extraction from a high hill in the city of Jerusalem. The modern day version of Zion as put together by Paul, the fabricator, is that it represents heaven. It is referenced in Revelation chapter 14 to Zion being a heavenly abode that will come down out of heaven in the last day as the tabernacle of the Most High. When you mention a tabernacle, you establish two things. You establish a place of worship and a place of dwelling. The books of Numbers, chapter 2, verse 2, tells you that the tabernacle was not merely just a place to worship, but it was also all the tribes of Israel was told to set up their tents there. Read Books of Numbers, verse 2. Every man of the children of Israel shall preach by his own standard with the incense ensign of their father's house. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. Now, what would happen is there was a holy of holy, which was equivalent to what we call Mechmer, or Masjid, or Jama, the place where the high priest, the tribe of Levi, or Loia, which is the Levite tribe of Ben Israel, who perished thousands of years ago. They were the holy of holies. They were the ones responsible for the rituals that took place in the 
sacred province of the temple like imams or sheikh or kohen or rabbis do in the synagogue. Then they had outside that curtains of tents where they had the altar set up which is the Ark of the Tabernacle where they would have their sacrifices to the Most High and they would put their offerings on those altars and sacrifice them. Outside that they had 12 tents set up and each one of those tents symbolized the head point for the 12 tribes of Israel in their day and time. By the time we came down to the Messiah, Isa or Yeshua, Jesus, the 12 tribes had perished. So David, who was doing most of the predictions for Jesus' lifestyle, predicted that Zion would be Judah. And that's why Jesus, the Messiah, said he only came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only, which represented the tribe of Judah, because he said, I came to my own, and he was of David to Judah. The only tribe of the tribes of Israel that exists today is the tribe of Judah. There is no Levite tribe, there is no Benjamin, there is no Ephraim, there is no Manasseh, and the tribe of Dan mixed in with Judah when they migrated south through Eden and into Habashia, which is now called Ethiopia, and became known as Palacians. And those tribes were the Danakal tribe today who moved up into Sudan and Nubia and mixed in with the family of the Fatimites who came up out of Arabia down to Egypt into Nubia and became known as Islamic Hebrews in the land of Nubia. They are a combination of the tribe of Judah, Danakal, and the seed of Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein who migrated over into Nubia, and out of that sea came Muhammad Ahmed El Mahdi. When you say the word Mahdi and you remove the meme, you get the word Huda, which is the root word for the word Judah or Yahuda, the same side. The name Mahdi is another way of saying you identify with the tribe of Judah. You understand? So when you mention Tabernacle and you mention Zion, remember Zion in the ancient times was a place. It applied to one tribe in the future, as we just read, which is the tribe of Judah only, because when the Messiah, Jesus, came, that's all he was looking for, the tribe of Judah and Judah only. Could you find in the scripture where it was written that this world will be never left without a witness? Which verse would you find that in the Bible? I haven't seen that in the Bible. You show me that in the Bible. I know in St. John chapter 16, when Jesus speaks about the coming of the prophet Muhammad, who he refers to as the comforter, when translated, which is the paraculus, in the Greeks, which comes out to the word Ahmed, or which is short for Muhammad, in the books of St. John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, and he said, I will never leave you comfortless. I will never leave you without someone like myself, is what he meant. And then he said in chapter 16, I will send unto you another comforter. But he was not to be from the house of Israel because the prophet Moshe, which we know as Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam, Moses told us in the books of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, 15 to 20, that he was going to send a prophet from among the brethren of Israel, not an Israelite, but outside of Ben Israel, from the seed of Ishmael would come that seed. And so he did say, Jesus, I will never leave you without somebody like myself. I will never leave you comfortless. And when he left, after Jesus went to Allah, after Allah raised him up, then after him, 570 years, thereafter came a man named Ahmed, which happens to mean comforter, born in Paran, which happens to be Mecca, where Ishmael seed migrated, where they also say Zion would be, when you read the books of Joel. So this man, this comforter, who he said was no, none other than the prophet Muhammad, who got his covenant through a man named Bilal, radiallahu anhu, who was from Hadashia or Ethiopia, and of the tribe of Judah, and had the power to pass the scepter on to Muhammad, which Jacob said would go into the hands of the Shiloh. And when the Shiloh, which was Muhammad, came, he received the scepter of Israel, and the covenant was complete. That's the story of the scripture. Outside of that, I don't know. What is this other name referred to as comforter? What is the, type, the, what is the supreme name? for comforter. Ahmed, which means gratitude. 
and or comfort or illustrious. It has many translations when you come to English. It's hard to define these names into one word. It gets its root from the Arabic word Hamada, same thing in Hebrew, which means to be grateful or to praise one. Or Muhammad, when we add a meme on it, was a preposition meaning one who is. Muhammad means one who is the comforter. Muhammad, one who is worthy of praise. What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit? Yes. There's many Holy Spirits in the Bible. But the main one they speak about when they say Ruhu al Qudus, which means the soul that is untouched, is the angel Jibrael who came down to Mary as a well-made man, right? And went into her and conceived Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit. But there is a point when Jesus himself created a bird in the form of a dove, where he was being baptized in the joy, and that dove was seen descending upon him as a form of the Holy Spirit. That again symbolized the angel Gabriel, who is the Holy Spirit. The Quran teaches us that Jesus created that dove that the Christians worship. The Christians just think it came from heaven, but it says that he, it was created. All right? Salaam alaikum. I was reading in Proverbs King chapter 13. And I'd like to know who was this man of God? Uh, what does the whole chapter mean? And the question is, who is this man of God? And what does the whole chapter mean? Right. Firstly, the first is the question that a Christian would try and give people is that they're talking about Jesus the Messiah. Correct? Yes. And as you go down and read, you'll find out that he burns bones and flesh of men and priests, things that Jesus himself never did. We eliminate that. Now, the person they're talking about, we find, is a man of Judah. 1 Corinthians 4.22 tells you that he was the father of Gideon, the judge. Judges 6.11 and 32 confirms it. A son of Ahab in 1 Kings 22.26. So, what I'm trying to say is that this person was of the house of Judah, was from the family of Gideon, the judge, and was not Jesus. Okay? Yeah. Also, what we did. So we suffer from it. The Christians was having a very serious time trying to convince the people of this Judite, the Nazarite and the Pharisees that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. But what they did is they took Old Testament scriptures and tried to make everything they could sound like it was Jesus the Messiah. You follow that? And because of the new listeners who Paul had reached called Gentiles who hadn't known the Torah, the five books of Musa, it was easy to convince them. But the children, the reason why you find in the times of Jesus, there wasn't a large conversion of the tribe of Judah or the so-called Israelites is because they were constantly in the scriptures and was able to go back to their rabbis and ask, what does this mean that he said? And then the rabbi would give a lecture on who that was historically and eliminated it. They didn't get their strong growth until Paul because the people who Paul was teaching were Gentiles meaning going for those who were only who were illiterate and did not read the scriptures and they had no form of reference so they only believed what Paul and them propagated. You understand? So a lot of times people are being misled by Christians in the thinking sections in the old scriptures pertaining to Jesus because the people who followed uh, Jesus' disciples and the people who followed Paul were two different people. Okay? Okay, I was, I was also reading Psalm 87. And I like in verses four, five, and six, you mentioned certain people. But I, I like to know who who they are. And Psalm and seven. What I'll do is I'll point out just one of them because these are just people. The name, of course, Rahab, means to be broad. And that was a harlot of the time of Jericho. You'll find that in the book of Joshua, two uh, verses one through twenty one. 
and 670 to 25. That's who Wahab was. Each of the other names are describing people. Five was a, a person who established a place, and that was a Syrianite. Philistinia was a person who became the father of the Philistines. And they didn't have the word Ethiopia in there. There was no such thing as Ethiopia back then. It was called Kut. In the scriptures, in Hebrew, as well as ancient Syriac Arabic, we have the word Kush, not the word Ethiopia. The white man is slick. He thinks by telling you something like Ethiopia, he can direct you into the wrong direction and flatter you at the same time. It was not Ethiopia, it was Kush. And Kush is in the land of Nubia to Sudan. The Ethiopians are broken up into three people. And a lot of a lot of people, especially amongst the Rastafarians and them, are being misled because they haven't taken the time to analyze Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, you have the Habashian, the Eritrean, and then you have the Falashian. The Falashian got the name from the Habashian, another word for Ethiopian. And they were migrants who came from Israel into Ethiopia, as it's called today, and moved up into the mountains. And they are the tribe of Judah. The standard Ethiopian is not of the tribe of Judah. He is no more than the Somalian who migrated south and mixed in with Indians who migrated north. That was in Ethiopia. The Arethians is nothing but tribes of Somalians also who migrated western parts of the continent. So what people do when they pick up the language Amharic, they're picking up a Christian Coptic language, which is not a biblical language. They're confused with, with Aramic, which is from Aram, which goes all the way back to the son of Shem, and that's what's the feeding of Kush. And if every time the white man wants to trick us, he puts the word Ethiopia instead of Kushite. Because if he puts Kushite or Kushi, then he'll be telling you that these were Nubians and Sudanese. But if he puts Ethiopia, he can direct you to a part of Africa that he controls by Coptic Christianity under a hypocrite who they refer to as Haile Salafia, who was not of the line of Judah, not of the house of Israel, but if he was, he would not have had an Amharic name, he would have had a Hebrew name, because his bloodline would have came directly from, he would have been something Ben Judah. We human beings called him Judah, the line of Judah. His name was Ratana Haile Salafia which is Amharic, not Aramic, which is uh, Semitic, not Arabic, which is Semitic, and not Hebrew, which is Semitic, but a Coptic language, which it got its origin in Greek, okay? And if you look at Amharic and look at Greek, you see the similarities. Okay, so I'll also want to live in the last week, but the Danakon tribe in Ethiopia, who are the Danakon tribe? The Danakon tribe? Yeah. The Danakon tribe, of the seed of Dan, because as on studying the scriptures, you know that Dan followed Judah. Some of Benjamin and some of Dan were seeds that came and went south with Judah. Most of Benjamin did not, but Dan did. When Dan migrated north and left the tribe of Judah behind, they migrated north, they ended up in a place that was called Nubia, and the village they set up was called Danakala, which came known as Danakala or Dongala, which is Dongala which is where the Mahdi seed came from, which meant that he was indeed not merely an Ishmaelite because of his mother being a Jalia, uh, but also an Israelite because of his descendancy migrating up there from the tribe of Dan, Danakala, which was indeed mixed in with Judah. Okay? So Danakon is nothing but the tribe Dan having migrated to Ethiopia, as it's called today, with Judah and mixed in with them and then went north. I like to know that why do some of the Muslim sisters you know, have to go to the white man's hospital? Why can't one that, like, you know, deliver here or whatever? Viewers in the community, in the community, you hear me say multiple times, why are y'all going to the hospital? You could be standing right in front of me with blood coming out your head. Let me know. And, and I can stop the blood, and I won't, because you don't have faith. And just because a person is in the mouth, it doesn't mean they have faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've watched people, they say, kill me, and I say, no. 
Why should I channel my energy to you? And then you're not going to. Let me tell you what Jesus used to say in the scriptures. What he healed the person, what was the first thing he said after that? Did you ever, did anybody ever pay attention to that part of it? No. All they pay attention to is when Jesus healed the person, when he healed the leper, when he healed the blind, when he raised the dead. They like that part of it. But the yeah. part where Jesus said right after that, now go and sin no more. Nobody wants to hear that part of it. Because the moment I do something for you to cure you of anything in the name of Allah, and then you go and commit another sin, you're twice as sick. A double portion of evil comes upon you. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, that would be bad for you. And it's worse. So you don't experiment with people's souls. So many times people come to me and say I'm sick, and I'll say you haven't even made the first step of coming into the tabernacle, but you want me to remove some illness from your body. Just for you to go back in the street and do wrong again. I'm not doing you a favor. I'm hurting you. If you're going to devote yourself to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and spend that time in his tabernacle, then you have his guidance. It doesn't make sense for me to step in when you have not even made a commitment to him. Right. You have to make a commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must be born again. You must be served to get that evil out of you. Otherwise, it will keep attacking your body over and over and over again. There is no sickness that there is not a cure for either physically or spiritual. There's none. No sickness that cannot be either cured physically or spiritually. You understand? Yes. And if people would have tuned themselves back with the spiritual world, they will not get sick so much. Right. They have to be in tune. You have to be on station without all the feedback and the noise coming through. Right. With the feedback and the noise and the temptations of the world. You all want the blessings of righteousness, but you want to live in sin. You want to say you righteous and still do evil and still do wrong things and still sneak. It doesn't work like that. If you want the blessings of righteousness and purity, then you have to vow to the Heavenly Father that you will sin no more. Now, that's a hard statement for you to make. And once you know you're supposed to make it and take your time, the time that you waste not coming to Allah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, on Yawm al-Akhri, which is the last day, will be multiplied one day per a thousand years. Let me make that clear. So in the day of sentencing, if you were destined to enter into paradise today, but each day that you did not come into a law where you do the truth, will be worth a thousand years in the lake of fire. Because everyone will take as the Quran says, then they return to us. Righteous people who stole Allah will spend longer periods in hell before they get out. Every man will take hell, then he will return to us. You understand that? There are people who know they belong in the tabernacle, just like in Israel's time, there were people like Nicodemus who came to Jesus, who knew he should have been Jesus' father, but didn't become involved in Jesus' life until the cross. You follow that? All that time that he wasted was over a period of years where he was reading, or as you would have it, reading the Aristotle doctrine and studying this with staying in the dunya, staying out in the world. But then when judgment time comes and everybody else, the angels come to receive the other people into the kingdom of heaven, these people will be held back where each day that they wasted will be worth a thousand years outside of paradise of your time. Okay? Right. How is coming into Ansara Allah mm -hmm. community yes. becoming Christ? In the, uh, in the book of becoming Christ. In the book of St. John, chapter 1. You ready? Okay, hold on. Okay. Uh, we, let me just start with verse 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed him. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek you? Or simply, what do you want? They said unto him, Rabbi, which we know means master or teacher, where do you live? They have where dwellest thou? Which means, where do you live? Okay? And he 
said unto them, Come and see where I live. Come and see. They came and saw where he lived, and they abode with him, which means they stayed with him, mm-hmm. right, that day. For well, it was about the tenth hour. But you'll find that from this point on, the disciples are always with him. That day they stayed because it was Sabbath. But from then on, those disciples went every place Jesus went, they followed. Every place he walked, they went. Every place he ate, they ate. So they lived together as a sign of what Jesus was teaching. And they stayed together. That was a sign of the presence of Christ with them. And he brought them together to live where he lived or to dwell where he dwelled and to eat with him and to break bread with him. That was a sign of being Christ-like, that you learn to love each other as you love yourself. You've been listening to The True Light, sponsored by the Newman Islamic Hebrew Mission and the original tent of Kidal, 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, where you can come and purchase The True Light tapes and the latest edition of The Pathers of Peace as authored by As-Sayyid Al-Imam Isa Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi. These informative pamphlets cover such topics as the science of healing, what and where is hell, you must be born again, and where is the tabernacle of the Most High. Available for your spiritual enrichment are Sufi oils and incense. We also have available a beautiful prayer rug designed by Al Sayyid Ali Maqis Al Hadi Al Mahdi. Be sure to come to the Hall of Knowledge at 548 High Street, Brooklyn, to see as well as hear the renowned master teacher who will change your life.